my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCRA, amines, amino acids, amides and chirality. That's quite a lot. So in this video we are going to look at these particular areas and it is dedicated to OCRA. So if you are studying A-level chemistry and you are your exam board is OCRA then this video provides you with all the information that you require for revision purposes. Um, and nothing more. So it is tailored for um, for your particular exam board. Um, there is a full range of videos on on the YouTube channel that covers all of the areas um, for OCR um, in year one and in and in year two um, on Allery Chemistry. So go and have a look there. Um, they're all for free. So all I ask is that you just subscribe to the channel, um, and that would be that would be grand, um, just to show you support for it. Um, also, if you would like a copy of these slides, they are available um, for your for your own personal use. Um, if you just click on the link below, um, you'll be able to purchase them um, from the from the test shop. Um, if you click on that, then it should take you there, and you should be able to find it uh, find it in there. Um, great for revision on the go. So if you've got your PowerPoint, uh, so if you've got your tablet or your smartphone, then you can use them on there. Um, all the stuff in this PowerPoint, like I say, is is for revision purposes and goes through the content. But it's also just as important to go through exam practice as well, because exam technique is just as important as knowing the content. So you've got to be able to be able to do that as well. Uh, on uh, Allery Chemistry YouTube channel, there is also some exam past paper workthroughs that will help you to improve your exam technique uh, to make sure that you're able to get as many marks as you possible possibly can um, and. You know, making sure you're using keywords in the right place and you're interpreting the question in the right way. Um, so there's loads of um, information on Allery Chemistry, so just go and have a look on there. Okay, so like I say, this is dedicated to OCR and it meets all of these specification points. Um, so you know that anything in here that you will need to know for OCR A, um, and there's nothing that you, you're wondering if you do need to know, if you don't need to know, everything in here you do need to know. Okay, so let's look at amines first. So an amine is derived from ammonia molecules. So ammonia is NH3. It contains a nitrogen atom where hydrogens are replaced with an organic group. So that could be an alkyl group, for example. So we get different types of amines. So we get primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary amines. So we're going to look at each one. So this one is a primary amine, which is methyl amine. Um, so you can see um, it has a nitrogen with one methyl group that's attached to it. So we call that methylamine. This is a secondary amine. So this is dimethylamine. And you can see here that we have a CH3 and another CH3. So we have two methyl groups attached to the nitrogen. So this is secondary. And then we have tertiary, which is trimethylamine. And you can see here we've got three methyl groups attached to the nitrogen. So this is a, a tertiary uh, amine. Uh, and then our final one is quaternary amines. So these are, for example, tetramethylamine ion. Um, so this is the only molecule that has a positive charge on it because you've got too many groups surrounding the nitrogen. Remember, nitrogen can only form uh, form one group. And actually, one of these is a, is a coordinate bond. Um, so um, normally that should be represented with an arrow, but this is just for diagrammatic purposes. Um, and it's a quaternary ion, so it has four organic groups surrounding it. Um, you also get aromatic amines as well, and these are primary amines. So, for example, phenylamine. Um, there is a video on uh, benzene um, in the year two playlist, so go and have a look at that if you're not sure about uh, aromatics. So, uh, non-aromatic amines are known as aliphatic. So, aliphatic ones are straight chain, uh, also, also non-benzene based, so anything with uh, benzene in, they're called aromatics. Okay, so amines, no surprise, act as a base. Okay, so amines have a lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen that allows them to accept a proton to act as a base. So the proton uh, bonds to an amine via dative covalent bond or a coordinate bond. And both the electrons in the bond come from one lone pair, which actually originates on the nitrogen, a bit like for the, the quaternary ammonium salt that we looked at before. So here's an example. So you've got your... Um, a primary amine in this case uh, on the left this is reacting with uh, an acid so this is acid is represented by h plus ions uh, and then we form our um our uh, ammonium ion and you can see here we've got our date of covalent bond both electrons from the nitrogen bonding to the hydrogen and obviously we all have an overall positive charge on that one 
So the strength of the base is dependent upon the availability of that lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen. And if that is, um, if we've got a really high density or it's very available, then the more basic it is. And the availability is pretty much dependent on what is bonded to that nitrogen. So if the electron density on the nitrogen, um, if the electron density in the nitrogen is really high, then it is more basic. Okay, so aliphatic amines are made by reacting a halogenoalkane with excess ammonia. So let's look at reacting a halogenoalkane and excess ammonia. Let's look at this reaction here. So in this example, we look at the reaction for chloroethane reacting with excess ammonia. So you don't need to know the mechanism for this. Okay, so you just need to know the actual reaction. So you see here that we've got ammonia reacting with um, uh, reacting with the, the haloalkane, as you can see. Um, we do form an intermediate in, in this case. Um, and then what we need is a second ammonia molecule. So we need two molecules of ammonia to react with our haloalkane. Um, and what this does is it actually produces our primary amine here, and we also produce ammonium chloride. So you don't need to worry about the mechanism for OCR. They're not so concerned about the mechanism. But what you do need to know is the reaction. So it's the haloalkane, and that reacts with two molecules of ammonia. So it's got to be in excess because we need it. Um, we need one molecule here, and we need the second molecule here. Um, and what we produce is our primary amine, but we also produce ammonium chloride as a, as a byproduct. So you do need to know the reaction, but you don't need to know the actual mechanism. Okay, so there we are. So we need two molecules of ammonia is required, and that's why the excess is there. Okay, so reacting the haloalkane um, with excess ammonia, so still looking at that, uh, that side of it. So we're using this method has a downside, uh, because in the mechanism that we've saw, the production of a primary amine, However, the reaction also goes on to produce secondary, tertiary, and quaternary, um, quaternary salts. So we actually don't get a pure product. So if we're in the industry to make a primary amine and just a primary amine, then this method isn't necessarily brilliant for that because we're going to end up with loads of other ones as well. So um, the reason why this occurs is because primary amines still have that lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, and so they can still act as a nucleophile. So they will still react with ammonia to form a secondary, uh, sorry, uh, react with a haloalkane to form a secondary amine. And then they secondary amines react again to form a tertiary amine and they react again to form the quaternary. And obviously the quaternary doesn't have a lone pair so it doesn't react any further. So um, like I say, it reacts with any remaining haloalkane um, and that keeps on going and reacts all the way to a quaternary salt. So you don't get a, you don't get a pure product with this whatsoever. Okay, so let's look at um, the ways in which we uh, produce your different types of amine. So, for example, you've got your primary amine there, which has got your lone pair of electrons. Um, and if we add a haloalkane or halogenoalkane, obviously we react the primary amine to form the secondary amine. You see it's still got the lone pair. Tertiary amine still has the lone pair. And then finally the quaternary ammonium ion uh, doesn't have any lone pairs, so it doesn't react any further, as you can see. So... The mechanism for making each of the amines is similar to what we've seen before, but don't worry too much about the mechanism. So it's just the reaction that is the same as we've seen before. Um, and here, as you can see here, we've got a primary amine um, reacting with the haloalkane just to show you in reaction form to form this secondary amine. So there's your primary amine there. There's your haloalkane or your halogenoalkane. Um, this is forming your secondary amine here. And then obviously we form our salt at the end there. So we always form this, this salt depending on what you're reacting it with. So you just need to be aware of them types of reactions. Okay. So how do you make aromatic amines? So all the ones that we've looked at here are all aliphatic um, hydrocarbon based amines. So aromatic amines are made by reducing nitro compounds such as nitrobenzene, which you would have seen in the benzene topic if you've done benzene um, and aromatics already. Um, but aromatic amines are used to make dye stuffs and pharmaceuticals. Okay, so they actually do have a quite an important use. So the first thing is we need to heat under reflux because we're using volatile compounds. So reflux is a good uh, method to use if we've got compounds which are volatile and we want to keep them. So under reflux, nitrobenzene with concentrated hydrochloric acid and tin, and it forms a salt such as C6H5, NH3, 
CL. So here we go. Here's the first thing. So we've got our nitro benzene. So this is the first step. Reacting with um, our reducing agent. So we need six of them. Concentrated HCl, tin catalyst, as we say. And the second step is the salt produced in step one is reacted with an alkali, such as NaOH, to produce an aromatic amine, such as phenylamine. So you can see here, what we've done is we've reduced it. We've reduced it down completely to form our water here. And all this is done under, all this is done under reflux. Now, the key thing here is the six bit. Okay, so you might be thinking, well, why, why do we need six hydrogens on this side? So the main reason is we need two to form our hydrogen. So we need two to, uh, sorry, to, to bond onto the nitrogen here to form our phenylamine. But also each oxygen here needs two hydrogens to form water. Okay, so because we have two oxygens, we need four of the hydrogens to form the water that we're forming here. So that's why we need six amounts of um, reducing agents compared to one molecule of nitrobenzene. So that's quite important in terms of the, uh, the reaction, but we always show a reducing agent as H in square brackets, as you can see there. Okay, let's look at amides. So amides are derivatives of carboxylic acids and have the functional group of CONH2. Now you might have seen amides already um, in the carboxyl, um, uh, the carboxyl topic to do with uh, carbonyl compounds. So it's the carbonyl compounds topic where we look at, um, uh, where we, uh, sorry, the carboxylic acid topic, that's the topic, where we uh, look at turning um, a carboxylic acid into an acyl chloride and then using acyl chlorides to form amides. So this is just building on that as well, but also um, it's just covering amides in a little bit more detail within this topic. So they have a functional group of CONH2. And they are a derivative, like I say, of a carboxylic acid. So you can see here we've got our primary amide here. So you can see the key feature here, what makes it an amide, the difference between amide and amine, is that an amide has a carbonyl group that's attached to an NH, uh, NH2 group here, so this is in a primary amide. So that's the main difference, is this group here. Okay, so like I say, we have that NH2 group on the bottom there. Uh, we also have something called secondary amides. So this is where we have uh, an R group, as you can see on there. That's instead of the hydrogen that would have been there normally. Now, these are also known as N-substituted amides, which you would have seen in the previous topic. Um, they have two names. So secondary amides or N-substituted amides, um, either that can be called um, either thing. Okay. Okay, so let's look at amino acids. So amino acids... Um, as the name suggests, contains an amine group and um, they contain an acid group, so the carboxyl group. So they are the basic building blocks of life and it's what makes up proteins um, in, our, in our body which allows us to live. So they are quite vital. So here is an amino acid and we have a carboxyl group which you can see in red there and we have an amino group which you can see in green. So amino acids are amphoteric. And what this means is they have acidic and basic properties. So they can react in, in many different ways. So amino acids always have an organic side chain. And here we're representing that by R. And this is in purple in the top here. Okay. And um, this is the, with the exception of glycine, where R is actually a hydrogen. But all the other amino acids will always have a, an R group that's attached here. So amino acids are chiral molecules. Okay. So they have four different groups, and we'll look at chirality um, in a moment, but anything that's chiral will have four different groups around a central carbon atom, and what they will do is they will rotate plain polarized light. Again, we're going to go through this in a little bit more detail later on, um, but glycine is the exception because it has, instead of the R, it has a hydrogen, so that means um, if it was glycine, it would have hydrogen and hydrogen, and that carbon would be bonded to two atoms that are the same, so it wouldn't be chiral, but all the rest of the amino acids are. So these are um, the examples that you're only expected to know at um, OCR Chemistry um, is an example of alpha amino acids. So alpha amino acids is where we have the NH2 and the carboxyl group attached to the same carbon. Okay, um, And they always have the general formula RCH NH2 COOH. Okay? So you can see here, this is definitely an alpha amino acid because we have our carboxyl group and our amino group 
bonded to the same carbon in the middle. There's no other carbons in between. So we call that an alpha amino acid. Okay, so amino acids react with acids and alkalis to form salts. Okay, so this is probably no surprise because we have um, we have a, a basic group, which is the amine group, the amino group, and we have the carboxyl group, which is the acid group, obviously on the other side. So alkalis react with the carboxylic acid group uh, in amino acids to form a conjugate base. Now, um, you might have seen um, uh, conjugate acids and bases in the acid base topic uh, acid base buffers topic uh, have a look at the playlist in year two if you're not familiar with that but you do need to understand what them terms mean but have a look in that topic and you'll be more familiar with it so basically here's our amino acid so our amino acid on the left here there it is there's our amino acid uh, that's reacting with our sodium hydroxide molecule um, so this is our base and what happens is this will only attack this bit because this is the acidic bit and it forms a salt there's your salt and water. So that's no different to any other acid-base reaction um, that we've seen. So acids react with the um, amino group to form a conjugate acid. Okay, so if we add an acid in there, it'll react with the amino group. So here it is. So there is your amino acid. This time we're going to react it with an acid, so a strong acid. And that will form our amino salt, as you can see here. So there it is. So we've added the hydrogen on there and the chlorine, so that forms your salt there. This bit is untouched because that's only going to react with the base. So this is what we mean when we say it's amphoteric. It can act as an acid and a base. Okay, so amino acids react with alcohols to form esters. So again, this is no different because we have a carboxylic acid in there and that's going to react with um, the alcohol to form an ester. So there's no difference. Just because it's called an amino acid doesn't mean you treat it any differently. The functional group still behaves in the same way. So like I say, the alcohols react with the carboxylic acid group in the amino acid to form the ester. And as usual, we need to use a catalyst um, such as sulfuric acid. Now, you would have seen esterification reactions in the carboxylic acid and esters topic. Um, have a look in the year two playlist for that. Um, but this is exactly the same reaction. Here's our amino acid reacting with our alcohol and there's our ester group that's been formed. So it will only react with the acid group here. The other bit remains unchanged and then we form water as well. So it's about looking for functional groups. Functional groups behave in a very similar way irrespective of the molecule most of the time, irrespective of the molecule that's bonded to. So that makes it a bit easier. So it's just about knowing the reactions that happens with the with the um with the functional group rather than worrying about the rest of the molecule. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at optical isomers here. So optical isomers um, are a form is a form optical isomerism is a form of stereo isomerism. And so they have the same structural formula but different arrangement of atoms in space. So we we said just before about optical isomerism, and you would have seen it in the transition metals topic, uh, where you have some um, uh, transition metal complexes that are um, chiral so you would have seen that where especially where you've got two groups you have to have two groups which are um, uh, sorry you have to have groups which are which have a mirror image and effectively they're chiral of each other um, but we also have some um, amino acids which are chiral as well so we're just going to go through this so optical isomers are mirror images of each other and they have a chiral carbon atom. So remember, that's a carbon atom with four different groups surrounding it. So that's the key thing. And we can arrange these groups in two different ways. And this forms two different molecules, and we call these enantiomers. And these enantiomers are mirror images of each other, and they're non-superimposable. No matter which way you turn them, they will not overlap. And so what I've done um, is I've created a video that looks into, um, it's very, very, it's not really a video, it's just an animation really. Um, it just looks into um, how hands, hands as an example, are chiral centres um, and they're non-superimposable, but they are mirror images of each other. Um, so let's have a, let's click here and let's just see, um, see how this works. You can see these are mirror images, your hands are mirror images, but you see if you overlap them, they won't actually superimpose. So here we go. Okay, so you can see that they were non-superimposable. So if we 
and just play that again so you can see the mirror images you move them over the top you can spin it around as many times as you want they will not overlap okay so that just shows um, that actually what we mean when we say they're non superimposable okay so these two molecules are also enantiomers so what we've done is just showed a basic diagrammatic form showing different colored different colors represents a different um, group that's attached to a central carbon atom we can see they are mirror images so they we have two enantiomers here so that there is your two enantiomers there's the chiral center and they are mirror images of each other because there's our mirror line and that's showing the two different um, molecules so if something is optically active in other words as a chiral center as we've just seen before we can distinguish or we can um, test for these because these will rotate plane polarized light um, and this is a way in which we can detect optically active compounds so standard light oscillates in all directions so you can see you can see that um, on there and if we pass light through a polaroid filter what we do is we produce plane polarized light so we cut out um, a lot of the other frequencies of light oscillating at all different directions um, and this means we only have a single oscillating wave so this is plane polarized that's what we mean when we say plane polarized now optically active compounds will rotate plane polarized light so in that test tube we have a sample of our optically active compound if it is optically active it will rotate plane polarized light in a particular direction and you can see that on there so one enantiomer will rotate light clockwise and the other enantiomer will rotate will rotate it anti-clockwise and we also know this is d and l okay don't worry too much about that but you'll see sometimes um, some of these things are prefixed with d and l that's just telling us which way it's going to um rotate plane polarized light so one will rotate it left and one will, will rotate it right so natural amino acids uh, are mostly l amino acids okay uh, apart from glycine so glycine is the exception because it's not optically active um, and most sugars are d isomers so the sugars that um, that you might find in your bloodstream okay so how do we find the chiral center so we need to find the chiral center um, and then draw them in a tetrahedral 3d shape to show them as an antimus so this will be something that they could ask you to do so first of all we need to find the carbon center so remember we're looking for four different groups surrounding a carbon atom so you can see here here's our um, substance okay so these are our different groups so we have the four different groups and these are surrounded by uh, these are surrounding the carbon in the middle which is our chiral center then we need to draw this using the tetrahedral 3d shape so here we go so there it is so basically we're putting the carbon in the center and drawn it as a tetrahedral shape so you would have come across shapes of molecules in year one and um, so tetrahedral is is an example of one of the shapes of molecules it has a, a bond angle of 109.5 degrees uh, between the between the bonds so if you're not familiar with that i suggest you go back and have a look at the year one playlist which goes into that in a little bit more detail so we draw the mirror image to show both enantiomers so there it is and that's how we draw them so you've got to be prepared to spot the chiral center and draw mirror images of your molecules as well so just be prepared to do that but you can see it's fairly straightforward you just need to make sure that you've accounted for all the atoms when you're drawing your 3d shape so it is possible to have molecules with multiple chiral centers um, and so you've got to be vigilant for them as well but the, the method is pretty straightforward you're just looking for a carbon with four different groups on it but you've got to look right along the carbon chain so let's have a look at ascorbic acid um, this is also known as vitamin c and is found in um, citrus fruits such as oranges lemons limes and it has multiple chiral centers so you can see this molecule here now they might give you large molecules like this and you might think oh crikey that's you know, I've never seen that in a life and it looks horrendously complicated but remember you're only looking for chiral centers you're just looking for something where you've got a carbon with four different groups surrounding it so let's have a look so we need to look for carbons with four different groups attached to it so there's one there so this is chiral as the carbon is immediately bonded to an OH it's bonded to a H remember it's skeletal formula so there is a H there a CH2 and a CHO okay so that's immediately bonded to four different groups 
and there's one here. So this is chiral as it's bonded immediately to an oxygen, to a hydrogen, to a COH. So this is the COH here, this group here, that's the COH. So that's bonded to a carbon with an OH on it and a CHOH as well, which is up here. So that's CHOH. So that's chiral as well. So you're looking across, so you're looking across that chain and finding out to see if there's four different groups attached to it. And that's it. So that's everything on amines, amino acids, amides, and chirality. So there's a lot in that one, as you can see. There's a lot of different different areas of chemistry. Not too bad, but a lot of different areas of chemistry. Um, like I say, there's loads of videos, a full range of videos um, for OCR. Um, on uh, on Alloy Chemistry on the Alloy Chemistry YouTube channel, uh, please subscribe to show your support. Support that all free. And like I say, if you want a copy of these, click on the link below, and you can see it in my test shop. Uh, I hope that was helpful. That's it. Bye bye.